So any other questions? Sorry, I should have stopped for questions. Yeah, go. Reversible process. Yep. No, haven't talked to this slide yet. Good question. Right here. So, um, I, when I think of entropy, and I, when I think of this equation, I can't forget it because I think, um, you know, talk the question about entropy is tedious, right? As in tedious, t d o s, and also tedious. Right? So the Q equals TDS is the yeah. Thank you. I know, right? All the jokes are second law jokes. Um, so the Q equals TDS. So if you, if you transfer heat by a reversible process, so over a very small temperature difference, then uh, the amount of heat that you transfer equals the temperature times the change in entropy. Okay? And so that's, a, that's I'd like to say that's how entropy is defined. That's actually how temperature is defined. Entropy is the, for the primary property, and temperature is an emergent property that comes out of the existence of entropy. Um, but, okay. Let's not go there. So, then you can get change in entropy equals ah, uh, dq on t. If you integrate both sides of this, so if you integrate ds just with respect to itself, then you, between 1 and 2, then you get s2 minus s1. If you integrate um, dq reversible on t, then you get an integral. And if you have a reservoir or something else that's in an isothermal process or your temperature of your boundary isn't changing, then you can just get your change in entropy is your heat flow across the boundary divided by the temperature of the boundary. So that's where that comes from. That comes from um, Q equals TDS. I've said this is, if the substance is a reservoir, where a reservoir is defined as something that doesn't change its temperature as you put heat into it or take heat out of it, a saturated substance is a reservoir as long as it remains saturated. So if you were to boil water at 2 degrees C, and we're all comfortable that this is possible now, because we've been studying thermo for a while, okay, if you were to boil water at 2 degrees C, how much heat would that require? Well, it would require that much heat, okay? It would be the change in enthalpy, would be the heat that you put into it. And at what temperature would you do this? If you're doing it reversibly, then you'd do it at an infinitesimally higher temperature than 2 degrees C. So that would be the temperature at which you'd do it. And we find that, and this answers your question for a specific case, right? You would find that the difference between these two numbers is indeed this number divided by this number in Kelvin, right? So this is Q and this is T and we find that delta S indeed equals Q on T if Q was applied in a reversible manner, right? In reality, your temperature won't be too infinitesimally smaller than 2 degrees C. If you're actually boiling water, you'd use something like 5 degrees C because you want to get some temperature um, across, which will generate entropy, which is where we're going next. So this is talking about entropy across a boundary. All right. um, this is to show how entropy emerges as something that increases when everything else is conserved. So energy is still conserved, the first law is still maintained, right? But now we've introduced the second law, entropy is increasing. So 100 kilojoules, so some arbitrary amount of heat is transferred between a thermal reservoir at 60 and a thermal reservoir at 20, okay? Entropy is going to be generated in this orange material in the middle, okay? And we'll see how that works. So using our formula before, the change of entropy is the entropy that comes in through the inlets, the entropy that flows out through the outlets, and then entropy as a result of heat transfer at the boundaries. Plus, entropy generated. There's no mass flow in this case. Well, we're just talking about um, a solid plate sandwiched between two other plates. So there's no mass flow. Um, so our S gen is just, and we've got two boundaries, not N, not some arbitrary number of boundaries. So we've got two boundaries. So it's the heat flow across that boundary divided by the temperature of the boundary at which the heat flow occurs. Right? So we've got 
and there's a there's a negative in front here. Okay, so our our Q hot is going to be negative in this case, right? Because heat travelling into the system has a positive sense. Our Q cold, so the heat travelling out of the system is swapped from a negative to a positive by the minus at the front, and then we've got our temperatures at the boundaries. What's the entropy generated? We set up an equation like that. It's wrong, of course, because it needs to be in Kelvin. Um, and so we've got, this is the entropy associated with the hot boundary, this is the entropy associated with the cold boundary, and we find that there is an amount of entropy generated through the process. The way that entropy wouldn't be generated if this was occurring was if the temperature of the hot reservoir and the temperature of the cold reservoir were the same temperature. So if you transfer heat between two bodies at the same temperature, you can do that without generating entry. Fantastic. We know that heat doesn't transfer between two bodies at the same temperature, so therefore all heat transfer involves entropy generation. But we could increase the temperature. So rather than going from 60 degrees to 20 degrees, you go. What if the temperature's the same but the substance is different? If the temperature's the same and the substance is different, yes. you still won't get heat transfer. Heat transfer follows a temperature gradient only. But it's a good question. Yeah? Can you, could you do anything with the entropy generated? Like, for example, heat, you can use it to make work out of it. Can you do anything with entropy? Or it's a good question. We measure? Can you do anything with entropy? Entropy generation actually represents the loss of usefulness. <laughs> so entropy is a bad thing. So no. Yeah, it's a... It's a property that exists, but it represents what we're losing in terms of usefulness. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, go. Could you try it, like, could your hot reservoir be, like, water vapor at negative two degrees and cold reservoir be ice at negative two degrees and you would transfer energy that way? You'll find it won't transfer energy. Unless there's a temperature difference, you won't get, because our, our conduction Oh, what is it? Newton's laws of cooling, so it must be Fourier's. Uh, was Q equals negative K A um, delta T? So heat, heat only flows if there's a difference in temperatures. So same question as the different substances question. Um, yeah, heat only flows across the... There is more energy in vapour at a given temperature than solid ice at a given temperature. But heat doesn't go from the more energetic compound to the less energetic compound. It goes from the hotter to the colder. The same could be said of, so water's got a really high thermal capacity. So let's take water at 40 degrees C and copper at 40 degrees C. Copper has a lower um, thermal capacity, lower C value. Put the copper into the water, they stay at 40 degrees C together. If they followed thermal capacity, the copper would get hotter as the water got colder to equate their thermal capacities. It's temperature that is equated, which is just crazy. Because temperature is not an easy to understand property. And I don't think there's any logical reason why things should thermally equate at temperature, but they do. So no, if you put uh, gas at 2 degrees C and water at 2 degrees C together, there will be no thermal, thermal change. They wouldn't start changing in terms of No. No, if you put a membrane there, no, they wouldn't. Cool, excellent. Good, I like it. Yeah, go. Where is the disorder going? <laughs> it's a very good question. Well, right. No, no. No, it's a good question. And I've actually, if you noticed I did something here, all right, that I didn't, I didn't talk about, right, was I just presumed 
that delta S is zero because this system is at um, a steady state, steady flow kind of process, right? So if we were to track the temperature of this, so we put temperature on this axis and we put distance x on this axis and we orientate our axis with x down, why not? The thermal reservoir is hot, the other thermal reservoir is cold, and then it's actually a straight line between those two points, okay? So, and it will remain so. Over, like, over time, it will remain that, that way, and heat will flow down the thermal radiant. So heat will flow from the top to the bottom of that. Um, yeah, because they're reservoirs, it's hard to see where the entropy is generated, but nothing's really a reservoir. The answer is that, well, you know, a reservoir's a um, theoretical construct. We just use it because it's, it's useful, right? The answer is there's usefulness in energy when something's hot. Okay, if I have like a rock at 200 degrees C, I can do things with it. I can burn you with it, right? <laughs> Bad analogy. <laughs> I don't know what depth of uh, my soul that came from. <laughs> but once, once that's down to 25 degrees C, like we all are, um, 20, 23 degrees C, like we all are, even though energy is maintained, so it's made the surroundings hotter, the rock's gotten colder, now I can do less with that rock. So entropy generation represents the decrease in usefulness of energy. Because there's a thermal reservoir that doesn't come across, but you're losing usefulness associated with the energy being in the hot space, and you're also losing usefulness of the energy associated with the cold space. If I have something cold, I can do something with it. If there's a temperature difference, I can force heat to, to be transferred. Does that help? Where does the entropy go? I know. And, it's, and the entropy is generated in this body, we say. Not in the reservoir, not in the, not in the two reservoirs across the body. It's a good question, though. Good. All right. Entropy generated. So we can't change the hot reservoir to 20 degrees C and still get heat transfer. We can change the hot reservoir to 100 degrees C, though. If we increase the temperature of the hot reservoir, then the entropy generated for the same heat transfer, right? So 100 kilojoules of heat is transferred. Now the entropy generated is 0 0.073, okay? For 100 kilojoules of energy transferred between 60 and 20, it's 0 0.040, or it's 0 0.041, right? So the larger the temperature difference, the greater the entropy generation. But the greater the temperature difference, the faster the rate of heat transfer. So you have to um, weigh that up. The, the smaller the heat difference, the smaller the temperature difference, sorry, um, the more efficient a process is, or the less usefulness of energy is destroyed, but the slower it is. And so you've got to um, equate those. Uh, here, this is, this, this is B, 100 kilojoules of heat is transferred. C, I just said 100 kilowatt of heat is transferred. You can um, do this on a rate basis. And now I've just said S gen with a dot on top of it. So this is just to show that it exists both as an absolute quantity, a specific quantity, and as a time rate quantity. How are we doing? Excellent. Go. So, what's the point of it? Like, why do we measure it? <laughs> why do we measure it? That's a great question. Why do we measure it? Because it represents the usefulness of energy to us, we can judge two different processes by the entropy generation, and the one with lower entropy generation is more efficient. And, uh, you know, it may not be obvious to you if I said I had a gas at 200 degrees C and, I don't know, 400 kilopascals. I'm reluctant to make up numbers, but that's all right. 200 degrees C and 400 kilopascals, or I had a gas at 100 degrees C and 800 kilopascals, which of those is more useful, right? 
that's not necessarily intuitive to know, but through entropy it can be, because entropy represents usefulness. So it, it has its uses. We, we're using it mathematically, so we'll try and use it just in that sense. Um, it's a good question. Cool. We'll look at an example of entropy generation in mixing, just to show. Um, I don't know if you can get a sense for those numbers. So it's a 0 0.0 something. Let's call it 0.1, all right? Just to get a, a sense of quantity of numbers. Um, mixing is really irreversible. If you have a steam and a compressed liquid and you mix them and you get some sort of saturated output, um, it's quite hard to um, re-separate those back out. And we see that when we talk about entropy generation. So PS is 4.5. I'm going to flick through this. I'm going to flick through the first law stuff because I assume you did, the, um, you did the problem solving session question. What's the final state of the fluid? We get our properties from our Rogers and Mayhu. We get our three enth enthalpies. Right, and we equate them. So this is, this is the first law. Here we equate out our enthalpies and we find that we get a saturated mixture with some sort of quality. Cool. How much entropy is generated? So now we know the final state and the end state. How much entropy is generated? The entropy generation is, so this is a single input, single output, uh, steady state, steady flow device. So we've got one mass flow rate. Okay, we've got the entropy as it leaves the system and the entropy as it enters the system minus the entropy generated by, or the entropy change by uh, heat flow across the boundaries. Our system's adiabatic, so we can disregard that last term. And so we can just say entropy generated is, so our fluid leaving the system has some entropy, S2, our fluid entering the system has some entropy, S1, okay? And because there's no change within the system of entropy over time, because it's steady state, steady flow, that entropy generated must be the difference in those two entropies. So that's our governing principle. Our entropy S1A is just read off the table. It's the entropy of saturated gas saturated vapour at a given pressure. I think that was defined in the problem. Entropy of S1B was the entropy of fluid, of a compressed liquid at 10 degrees C. And then our entropy exiting the system is our quality which we calculated using the first law. And it's just the entropy 40% of the way between that number and that number. And we would find that the entropy generated is 2.6 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Okay. Yeah, go. Why does the entropy of the fluid increase when the temperature increases, but the gas decrease when the temperature increases? Why does the temperature of the fluid... No, the entropy of the gas... Why does the entropy of the gas... ...decrease when temperature increases? Yes, that's a good question. Okay, the question is, if I can rephrase it and not butcher it, why does the entropy go up as you go in that direction and go down as you go in this direction, right? 4.9 is less than 5.2 is less than 5.7? Yeah, yeah. That's your question? Okay, excellent, good. Yes, and this has to do with usefulness and order, right? You notice that the temperature is going up from minus 30, so this is a saturation table, so we're tracking both temperature and pressure. So the temperature is going up, but the pressure is also going up. Temperature going up has the effect of increasing the number of options of what the particles can be doing. Right? Pressure going up has the effect of decreasing the number of options. It pushes them all into the same space. And, yeah, so th this number is saying, oh, no. <laughs> this number is saying that this fluid is more useful. Oh, sorry. This number is saying that this fluid is actually more useful and more ordered than this fluid. So that's what that means.
Did I mention I've been avoiding teaching this topic? <laughs> but I like it, I like the discussion. I think, I think we're going okay. Here you go. Of course. Okay, sorry, okay, if I can rephrase your question. Why are the numbers getting bigger down this row? Why is 1.2 bigger than 0.8? Yeah, yep, no worries. Because pressure has less effect on liquids. So in a gas, a pressure will compress it and constrain it, limit its options. For a liquid, it doesn't really do very much in terms of constraining its options. So temperature here, is governing the change in entropy. Temperature is a, a larger changer than pressure is, whereas for the gas, pressure is a larger changer than temperature is. It's a good question. I don't know, I, don't, I haven't even looked at that aspect of the tables, to be honest. Cool, good. But it makes sense in light of what we now know about entropy. Um, oh, sorry, S2. Sorry, that wasn't the answer. The answer was then S generated is Whatever the entropy going out of the system is, <coughs> minus whatever the entropy going into the system is, this looks better. And so the entropy generated is 0.4 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin, which is about an order of magnitude greater than the entropy generated through our heat transfer. Um, you'd have to do a problem that involved heat transfer and <coughs> mixing to get a sense for it, but mixing's really highly uh, irreversible. And that a little bit speaks to your question about what do we use it for? So we can measure irreversibility, the extent of irreversibility, by the entropy generated. This is generating more entropy than the other one was. This is more irreversible, harder to reverse than the other one was. Okay. Everyone's talking, I like it, on topic. It's like favorite lecture ever. So, what is <laughs> my, my nightmare scenario is me talking for two hours which is weird as a lecturer. Um, so what do we say when we've got nil or entropy, uh, negligible entropy generation? Um, nil, of course, being just a, a, an abstract concept that we don't actually achieve. So we can't have mixing, right? We can't have um, vapor and uh, liquid mixing to become something else. Uh, we have to keep things in, in quasi-static states, so no free expansion. Uh, and we need to have no heat transfer across the boundaries, uh, which, of course, is very difficult to achieve. Entropy is a property. So although entropy generation is based on the path that you take, um, what the temperature difference is and so forth, within the fluid itself, entropy is a property. So just like temperature and pressure and enthalpy, it's independent of the path that it took to get there. So you know that liquid water at 100 degrees C has this entropy and it always has that because it's a property value. Was it hot before, was it cold before, it doesn't matter. So the value is independent of the path um, I want to speak to your point about negative entropies and, uh, and how those occur. So just like with internal energy and enthalpy, this is um, Central and Bowles' take on these things, they've just picked a zero point for internal energy and enthalpy and entropy. So they've just said, let's take the triple point temperature of water and say that at the, the fluid state, for that, we'll give those a zero. With central and bowls, and the reason I use central and bowls tables, is they also have ice vapor, saturated ice vapor, not just liquid water and vapor, but ice vapor tables. And because of how they've defined things, at the triple point of water, in the ice state, it indeed has a negative entropy. All right? So that's how you can get negative entropies occur. Because they just pick an arbitrary zero point, which feels like a pretty good one. Triple point of water is something that's nice and fixed. Um, the actual zero point of entropy, like the zero point of potential energy, is out in space where there is no gravity. The zero point of entropy is at zero degrees Kelvin in a perfect crystalline structure. And that's the third law of thermodynamics, which we don't cover. And then it also says you can't get there through a non-infinite number of processes. Um, mm. If you don't have a perfect crystalline structure, then there's options as to where the atoms fall, as to where the discontinuities um, 
happen. And if you're above zero degrees Kelvin, there's some movement which has some aspect of randomization. Right? So the true zero entropy occurs there. For our purposes, numerically, zero entropy occurs um, at the triple point of water, saturated fluid. Let's do more. Let's keep going. I started late. Mainly went long. Watch out, waving your hand, I'll think you're asking a question. So, let's, so that's what we covered, and I think that was pretty thick, and I think you've done very well. Can I just introduce Gibbs equations, and we'll finish them up next week. So this is now, again, further use of entropy as a mathematical construct. This is similar to your um, lab two, if you've done it. If you haven't done it, you should have read the pre-lab, or be close to reading it. Uh, dry atmospheric air at sea level is compressed with a pressure ratio of P2 and P1 is 5, and a polytropic index, N equals 1.25. What's the change, what's the specific entropy change in the air as a result of this process? So for, uh, for fluids we can look up on tables, right? so for pure substances we look up our tables, for ideal gases we need to use formulas. That's pretty much been consistent with um, how I've used these. So what are the formulas relating to entropy as it relates to ideal gases then? Gibbs equation comes out of this relationship. It's Josiah Gibbs. I didn't name my son after Josiah Gibbs. We probably both named our children after an earlier Josiah, but that's, um, you know, it's just funny that's how it happened. Um, so we know that Q minus W equals DU, right, in a in a closed system. If the heat is reversible and the work is reversible, that's still true. Okay? And we know that reversible heat flow is tedious. Reversible work is the pressure at which it occurs multiplied by the change in volume. Okay? We've just called that work for our purposes, but in truth you get slightly less work out um, because of friction and irreversibilities, and if you put work in to compress the substance, you need slightly more work. We've just kind of ignored that a little bit. Nevertheless, th those remain true. So if you substitute these in, and you say, well, let's put TDS in for that, and let's put PDV in for that, and take it over the other side of the equation, this then becomes Gibbs equation related to entropy and its relationship to internal energy and pressure. The fascinating thing with this is, even though, we, even though we got there using Q and W, which are path variables and not state points, the end result only has properties. So it holds true in every generic case. So this is a path independent um, equation. And I've got it there in the capital form, and also in the um, specific form, so total, entropy, and so forth, and specific. Similarly, now we've got this equation. We know something about du, or we can develop something about du, knowing our definition of enthalpy. Okay, if we differentiate, yeah, if we differentiate enthalpy, then the differentiation of H is dH, the differentiation of U is du, the differential of PV is product rule, differential of the first times the second plus the first times the differential of the second. Okay, so that comes down to this equation. We rearrange du as a subject of the equation and then we can substitute that in where du was. You see we've got a minus PDV and a PDV and we get a second form of Gibbs equation of TDS equals change in enthalpy minus specific volume change in pressure. So let's leave that there and we'll restart at Gibbs equation and then that'll let us calculate entropy change in solids, liquids and gases. That's where we're going next week. Thanks guys. Any further questions? No. Back up. Go away. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Loved it.